Most people think of ads in their Facebook feeds as, at worst, a nuisance. But there's a ton of evidence some ads on Facebook during the last election were far more nefarious, bought by Russian agents looking to influence our democratic process. It's put the unregulated Wild West of social media advertising in the crosshairs of Congress and members of both parties. But how do users of social media feel about the idea? And would it make any difference if there was regulation? We've asked that question in a new mayor's poll, and this time on Poll Hub, we're going to get some answers. Let's get started. Hi, everybody. This is Poll Hub. I am J.D. Dapper. And I'm Lee Marigoff, director of the Marist College Institute for Public Opinion. And I'm Barbara Carvalho, director of the Marist Poll, and we're here in Poughkeepsie, New York, on the Marist College campus. Are you on Facebook right now? Always. Always. We're always on Facebook. Mm-hmm. It's, it's the latest. It's the latest. It's um, amazing how many people worldwide are on Facebook and how much time they spend on it. I remember uh, doing a class here. Uh, I've done Well, I've done classes over the years. One of the slides I put up almost every class, which would be every six months or so, is the number of people, the amount of time people spend on social media versus other things like television and radio and stuff like that. And it just keeps climbing. And that that amount of time they spend on social media is almost all on Facebook. And now it's something like three or four hours a day. Every mm-hmm, day mm-hmm. people are spending And so increasing. Facebook. And yeah. surprise, surprise, it became such a big part of the 2016 presidential campaign uh, because its ability to reach people in, in a unfiltered and direct way. Um, I know you've talked a lot, as you say, in Marist classes about Facebook and and the surge in usage. Um, Talk a little bit about what it is, why it's part of this this technology that's so overtaken us right now. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that that, um, we focus on when we think about Facebook is we think about it as a social platform that we communicate with each other on. We tell our friends what we're doing and we keep in touch with family and things like that. But the other side of it is what I think a lot of people are waking up to right now with this current kind of controversy, and that is it's primarily an advertising platform. At least it is for Facebook. That's how they make all their money. They don't charge you to use it. And as an advertising platform, it has some really particular uh, benefits to advertisers that don't exist elsewhere. Elsewhere, so one of the, well, the companies I founded um, is a Facebook advertising company, and so I, I, we've <laughs> dealt in great depth with and seen the changes in how to effectively advertise in Facebook. And, and one of the key components of that, and I think, why this really plays into the political discussion, is the ability to target ads really narrowly. If you think about most advertising, political advertising, it's on television, and you basically buy a 30-second spot in the the nightly news in a market, say, in Columbus, Ohio, because Ohio is a hot state and it's going to be a competitive state. And so you buy it in Columbus, you buy Cleveland, you buy Cincinnati. Well, you're reaching a lot of people with your message that won't vote or that have already decided or that are too young to vote, um, or some people that may not even be registered to vote or are residents of Ohio. So if you if you think about the million people you may reach in that ad, there may be only 100,000 or 200,000 that are even open to it. It may be far fewer than that, and you've wasted all that money. And probably only half of them are going to vote. So, right. So you're even getting down to so, a smaller number. Right. So one of the, the benefits of Facebook is you can now take that million people you wanted to reach or you are reaching and say, well, I only want to reach the handful of people who are persuadable who are likely to go vote. You can do that in Facebook. So you save a huge amount of money and you can reach them repeatedly with different messages that appeal to things you know about them. Yeah, Targeting yeah, is know, amazing. Hold, hold right there. Talk a little bit about the different messages because I think that that is really interesting uh, because we are used to seeing advertising in lots and lots of places. I mean, if you've been you know, surfing the web over the last you know, 20 years, you know, you, you're not immune to advertising. But talk a little bit about why the targeting of different messages in Facebook is actually a little bit different. Sure. So if if I'm running a campaign for a candidate and one of the issues is, say, guns, gun control, and the other is, say, um, health care, and I'm a pro-gun, pro-health care person. So I want to reach – I do not want to get my pro-gun message to anti-gun liberals, but I do want to get my health care message to, the, to them. Now, this may be a hypothetical candidate that seems fairly unlikely in our current climate, but there are people obviously like this, and, and, and it's a way to explain w- how easy this is to do. You can identify people who are likely to vote for you as a liberal who uh, are interested in health care with a health care-only ad. You can create a second ad 
for virtually no money, it's very simple to create ads in, in this way, that talks about guns and target that only to persuadable people who are pro-gun, who might be persuadable because they tend to be liberal, say, on other issues. Say it's pro-gun Democrat we're talking about. That's something that Facebook allows you to do, again, at a very, very narrow focus. Remember also, you can target by zip code. So now, if you're running a house race, for instance, you're not going to waste dollars in a market that may have three other house members in it. You're going to spend only dollars in the zip codes of people in your district. It's incredibly efficient, not always necessarily effective, but it's incredibly efficient. And because these ads are kind of the Wild West, nobody's really looking at them before they go up in any meaningful way, you can do some things you can't do on although, TV. Although Facebook does identify ads. I mean, you do see the the sponsored. I think one of the issues that was perhaps a little different um, with what seems to be the Russian influence is the fact that they actually created profiles of people as well and organizations. Right. So th- they did what modern politics have been doing for a long time. Remember soccer moms? <laughs> there, sure. there, it wasn't actually a soccer mom. You didn't have to have a kid playing soccer to be a soccer mom. Soccer moms described a type, and advertisers do this all the time. Uh, advertisers describe a prototype or a paradigm or whatever, this, this, this thing, a soccer mom, that has certain attributes. And those attributes can be identified and targeted. So if they match all 16 of these attributes, they drive a Subaru or a Volvo, they have kids that do blah, 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 then they tend to fit a certain profile that, that politics, you know, politicians can use. This has been done starting very big in 2000 was the first time it was really effectively used. But with Facebook, it allows you to take that data that you have and now target. So before you could identify, but it was hard to target. Now you can take the identification and you can target. You know, I always think, uh, you know, we poll a lot in the New York area uh, as well as around the, uh, the country. And I know you were a political journalist in the, in the New York TV market for quite some time. I always thought of those TV ads and how, you know, you're trying to reach, let's say, you're running for mayor of New York City and you're trying to reach New York City voters. And yet you're reaching Long Island. You're reaching Poughkeepsie, New York. You're reaching New Jersey. If you're running for governor right now of New Jersey... Your ads, I'm seeing them in Poughkeepsie. Well, so in, it, New Jersey is a great case. Yeah. Uh, the two major media markets, markets in New yeah. Jersey are not in New Jersey. They're in Philadelphia and New York. So most of your ad spend is spent on people who can't vote for you. It's incredibly inefficient. Now, part of, I mean, part of what the social networks are arguing, too, is that they are social networks, not necessarily social media networks. Do you think that's a... No, they're adver- for the distinction. No, I think they're advertising platforms. Uh, uh, that's what they are. They are there to put advertising in front of users. Facebook doesn't make money unless that happens. So let's not let's not mince words. They aren't a social network. They're in a social media network. They're none of those things. They're an advertising platform because they have an audience. That's the way this. That's the way things work. And and I'm not saying that's good or bad. That's what they are. So, so is the issue for 2016 that Facebook came of age or Russian interference in our election? Through Facebook, I think I think both things. Okay. I think what happened is we, we ended up uh, Facebook advertising uh, for all intents and purposes didn't exist five or six years ago in any meaningful way. Now it is a huge and growing part of most brands' budgets, and so for politicians, of course, they're going to follow what good marketers do. I think what happened here is that the the Russians, if what we think happened happened, is that they understood as well as any good marketers understood how to use Facebook. It's not a secret. I mean, you just go online. You can figure out how to do this. This is not hard to do. It's just I think that the culture, especially the political culture in this country, I don't think is caught up. I know lots of political consultants who work with candidates who have a really hard time convincing them they shouldn't spend their dollars on TV. They should spend them on Facebook for the very reasons we just talked about. It's a huge waste. But the politicians and the consultants go, oh, but but TV, that. It's TV. We got to be on TV. No, you don't. And also, but pol- the Russians realized that before many politicians, American politicians, and cult- cult- consultants get a cut of the TV. Buys well, they get a also. cut of the Facebook buys so, too, but the Facebook buys are much lower, and that's why there's no economic incentive. So we, for we've, been, course, we've been asking Americans about this very topic. So Barb has some of our well, latest. One, you know, results. one of the things that I think is really interesting is in this poll, we asked Americans uh, on a, a 
things on a couple of different issues. And one of the things was about um, whether they thought elections were fair. And that that pretty much divided and was very polarizing, particularly um, across party lines. Um, but we also asked them um, about these social media platforms and whether they would want to have some kind of regulation. And what we found, which was really interesting, is 47% of Americans thought that these platforms should be regulated just like other types of media for political campaign ads. 17% um, thought that they should be regulated but do the self-regulation. In other words, they should just be regulated by themselves. And only 27% thought that there shouldn't be any regulation at all. And a majority, at least a majority of Democrats, actually Democrats overwhelming. 71% of Democrats felt there should be regulation, but even 55% of Republicans thought that these sites should be regulated in terms of ads for political campaigns. And overwhelmingly, uh, Americans um, favor the idea of at least identifying the sponsor um, of an ad. Who, so, who paid for so it? So this ad was paid for by the Putin criminal, cri uh, criminologist. Well, it's alleged. It's alleged. It's under investigation. Doesn't I mean, sound but right. I think I think that investigation does does you know present a number of sure. very significant questions that we're going to see uh, you know moving forward. 20, 2018, 2020. What do you envision, Jay? As you know, how is how are we going to come to terms with what this new revolution in communication is all about in terms of our campaign uh, environment? Yeah, I mean, I think that ad dollars, as they have, I mean, one of the one of the things you, you know, you always hear you always hear the phrase "follow the money," right? So in politics, follow the money, but also in campaigning, follow the money, and to some degree, follow the best marketing practices of brands. So political campaigns are advertising campaigns. At the end of the day, they're just a big advertising campaign, and the product is the candidate. Um, uh, politics in general lags several to many years behind the best marketers in terms of how they spend their dollars and how they how they use them with the kinds of messaging they create. A lot of that has to do with just the very conservative nature of politics in general. Pe not conservative with a big C, but with a small C. People like to play it safe. Risk is frowned upon uh, in many cases. So I think what we're going to see is what we've already seen among advertisers and brands, which is a continuing flow of dollars away from the traditional media, away from mail, away from television, away from radio, away from print, what's left of it, and towards social media. And that includes Twitter, that includes Instagram, that includes Snapchat, and of course, Facebook. And as that happens, I think it's only logical to assume that what happens in television, which is regulated by the FCC, none of what we're talking about is regulated by anybody, right? But I think it's fair to assume that the social networks, the social companies, the social media companies, these advertising companies like Google, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, they are going to uh, self-impose or restrict um, political advertising, not restrict it, but um, introduce the idea that you got to identify who well, you sure. are. It's already I mean, done in TV. Well, but, but also, they, they want to be one step ahead on the on the whole issue of regulation. Right. They, don't they, be, they don't want to be regulated. If they can say, no, no, we're going to require that, then they're hoping that Congress would back off and not actually impose anything that's written into law. But I think that's an, that's also an easy sell. If you think about why, what, what the primary motivation of Facebook is, or any of these, it's to keep you on there. Spend more time there. So, if the user experience is bad, people will spend less time there. So Facebook has in its own vested interest um, the idea to keep political messaging as openly political and honest as possible. Not honest with the message itself, but honest as being a political ad and who it's from. So I think it's in Facebook's best interest to insist that you've got to identify where you're from. Now, whether you have whether they're going to police it by looking at filing records and things like that to see who really is behind it, who's really contributing to some of these organizations, I find that a lot more doubtful. I think that, if you, to answer your, your question in the long term, I think we get to 2020, and yeah, everybody identifies it. Americans for good sense. Well, who funds them? Facebook's not going to tell you, but they're putting ads on your Facebook feed, and I'm not sure that really solves so the problem. So we have to dig down even a little bit deeper than that. So we know that in this new environment, we're going to be following the money. Uh, I guess when we see what happens with the Russian investigation, we'll find out whether we're also following the rubles. And in the Dominion of Virginia... There is an incredible race going on. It's actually, we've talked about this before, there's really only two races that ever get any attention, maybe three, in the year after a presidential election. New York City mayor, which isn't getting a lot this year, 
uh, the New Jersey governor, which isn't getting a lot this year, and Virginia, which is, for a whole bunch of reasons, it's more of a swing state than, than either of the other two places. Uh, and the uh, Republican candidate kind of represents Donald Trump, and the Democratic candidate does not. So the parties are putting a lot of uh, weight behind what the meaning of this election is. Uh, but the polls are all over the map. What is happening? Well, it is truly a mess from a polling standpoint. We're going to dig down a little bit and find out what's going on uh, when when we uh, sort of examine this in greater depth. I think one of the things, though, the fundamental question here, when you're looking at a state like Virginia, and there's a whole bunch of polls out, um, and some are showing a very different race. So, for example, in the Quinnipiac numbers, uh, you're seeing a 14-point lead right now for the Democrat, Ralph Northam, in the Monmouth University poll, you're seeing a two-point advantage for the Republican Gillespie. So you're seeing a 16-point gap between those two candidates, uh, Democrat, a Republican. One, one point for Gillespie. Oh, I'm sorry, one point. I was giving him giving a, a, a little boost Although there. Although I think what, what you were looking at is also that um, it, it's more Republican than Democrat. Yeah. So why are these two polls different, and why are the polls all over the map? Uh, and and are, we, we remember, I think, from the 2016 polling, there was a lot of talk every, uh, uh, in various states about polls that were outside of the kind of the norm yeah. or the average, and yeah. they were called outliers. Yeah. Are either of these an outlier? Well, well that's the, what does that mean? That's that's the big media poll question. In other words, what is a poll? That's very different from the conventional wisdom, from the expectation. Well, also from the mean. If you take all of the polls and you average, average them, them up, together. you now have an average. It's the it's the it's the it's the middle of of what all the polls have shown. And in, and in this case, let's be clear, both of these polls are outside the mean. The mean has yes, the Democrat exactly. up by four or five points, yeah. I believe. So, so we have, so we, do we, we have two outliers we, we or may, what's going on? We may have a double a double outlier effect. Well, but the, average think, is, the average is just under six. So so there are pretty much right in the middle. Okay, we've talked in uh, earlier podcasts about the, um, the party ID and how Democrats are, who identify as, as, as Democrats or tend to vote for Democrats, Republicans as Republicans. And how important that is in polling, because if the recipe is more Democratic or the flavor is more Republican, you're going to get a very different result. Surprise, surprise, in the particular poll, let's start with the Quinnipiac poll, uh, you this have— This is the one where the Republican is actually— uh, no, I mean, where the, the Democrat. Democrats ahead by 14 By points. 14 points, and the Democrats are plus 10 percent in that poll. Plus ten and meaning 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 well, ten, ten points ten yeah, points ten points more um, democratic. more democratic and as a secondary point on this um, the Quinnipiac numbers have gone from ten to fourteen and the party ID from their previous poll has gone from seven to ten so this poll for them is not only very democratic it's more democratic and the Democrat has a wider lead than he had before. Flip it over and you go to Monmouth University and you have just the opposite picture. There you've got a uh, a uh, five-point Democratic lead becoming a one-point Republican lead. And what do you think is happening to the party ID? It went towards the Republicans. It went from plus seven Democrat to plus to Republicans. So is this just cooking the changing the recipe on the soup? Is it cooking the books? Is it? No. I mean, mixing metaphors there. But what's going on here? What I well, which I one's right? I don't think I don't think it's in, it's intentional, and we won't actually know which one is right for a couple more weeks, and we'll probably see a couple of more polls. Um, but I think this is what has driven people to take an average because we look at these polls, they look very confusing. So let's just average it up and kind of figure it's in the middle. Mm, but but that's tough to do. The Quinnipiac poll um, has been done uh, in a traditional scientific method. They have a pretty rigorous methodology. But what they seem to struggle with is when they move from adults to registered voters and then to look at likely voters. The important uh, category the, in this. What, And the people who are going to show up on election day and actually vote. Um, we've, we've seen over time that they tend to have uh, be a little bit off the mark. Um, and, and is not, this, a li- just to be clear, is this a likely voter, Paul? This is these like, are both likely these voters? Are both, yep. These are both this likely voters. 
apples these are as both, far as the numbers are concerned. Well, in terms of the pool of voters that they, they're talking about. Like uh, the it's, voters. It's not, it's not apples and apples. It's not the, it's the same kind of fruit um, when you look at their methodology. Their methodologies are very, very different. The Quinnipiac poll is taking random numbers, and they're talking to adults throughout the state, and then they're using a methodology to, to whittle down and drill down to figure out who's registered, uh, what party they identify with, and then if they are likely to vote on election day. So let me, I just want to stop you there. So that's kind of what we've been talking about is is kind of the right way, if there's a right way to do if it. there's a gold you're le- standard, you're, absolutely. You're letting the people who you're talking to tell mm-hmm. you who they're going to vote for or what party they identify with. You're not like way, you're not moving things around. No. You're asking them. You're not and, modeling you know, it to, a, to some kind right. of pre, okay. preconceived notion. Good. Yeah, so, that's so, a, so that's an absolutely a good thing. But what, we, but we have, what we've seen in the past is that uh, the questions they use to identify and define a likely voter haven't necessarily um, – measured that group of individuals. As accurately as, as you might want. Exactly. Okay, so what about and, Monmouth? And but let me just, yeah. uh, just let me just point out that um, it's, it's not that they've been Democrat all the time or Republican all the time. It has gone back and forth. They've overstated Democrats and Republicans in, in a right. variety of races so, over so, time. So, so now let's talk about that Monmouth poll. because we So that's a Quinnipiac poll. Up by 14 Democrats, it's a runaway. Uh, Monmouth poll, no, it's not a runaway. In fact, the Republicans could have win. And what did they Monmouth do? What's is their... doing something a little differently. Um, we've talked a lot about the fact that there's a lot of experimentation in polling because it costs an awful lot of money to do um, to to do it in a way um, that is tr- a traditional manner that's very scientific and very rigorous. So Monmouth, in the last uh, cycle in 2016, started using what we call um, registered-based sampling, which is instead of going to random telephone numbers to talk with people on cell phones and landlines, instead they go to these companies that aggregate and collect all of the information about registered voters in a particular state. And then they select their sample from that. And that sounds like a good idea because now you're at least, you've at least got the people who are eligible. You're talking to registered voters. You're talking to registered voters. That seems like a good thing. Absolutely. And in theory, it really is. In practice, not so much. Because what happens is when people register, they don't necessarily have to give a lot of information and they don't necessarily have to provide a telephone number uh, when they register. So these telephone polls need to figure out how to get that telephone number. So they'll select a sample from people who have provided telephone numbers or for whom we've been able to match the telephone number. So there was enough information in the registration um, information to go to another company to match the phone number to that person. And we did this this past election cycle, and we were not loving, as an experiment, the matching. Well, we did a little bit differently. We we actually spoke to people using random digit Mm -hmm. dialing, which means we go and we get a random number and call a household. Um, And then what we did was we took the people who spoke with us and completed an interview, and afterwards we went to one of these companies um, one of, that aggregates the registered voters. And we said, well, how many of the people we spoke with can you match? And the match was very low. It was, it was under 40%. So it, they miss cell phone, younger they, voters, stuff like that? A- absolutely. All of which would, in this case, and I don't want to read too much into this, but in the case of the Monmouth poll where the Republicans slightly ahead – Republican voters are going to be older, they're going to be more rural, they're going to be less likely to have cell phones and to be dependent on landlines, whereas younger voters, Democratic voters, urban voters are going to be less likely to have a landline and probably less likely to give their cell phone And if you look at the two samples, the Monmouth sample is mostly landline sample, and if you look at the Quinnipiac poll, it's mostly cell phone sample. Which is going to make it more Democratic and less Republican, just like you said. But here's my problem with this. Okay. I like the fact that both of these polling groups are adhering to transparency. If we didn't, they didn't, we wouldn't even know these numbers. We couldn't even have this discussion because we wouldn't know what their party recipe was. But here's my problem. 
Less so with the Quinnipiac poll. They went from a plus 7 Democratic to a plus 10. So their sample's a little more Democratic, but not enormously. But look at the Monmouth numbers. They went from a plus 7 Democrat in their sample to a plus 2 Republican. That's a 9-point swing. That's a 9-point swing. So, hello, no wonder the thing has moved more Republican uh, because so, of that. So, and but, so I don't think we have a good answer for that. But interestingly, my, my feeling, though, is that they drew the sample in the same way. Yes. Because when they drew the sample, they based it also on whether people not only were registered, but whether they had participated in elections over the past couple of years. Which is a good um, way to determine likely voters. Precisely. Mm -hmm. um, and what they found was they got a breakdown of people who, about the same, of people who had participated in primaries in the past. And in both samples, about half of the um, individuals that they that were in the sample had participated in a Republican primary, and a little more than a third had participated in a Democrat pri primary. And that makes sense given you know the the, the last uh, the last cycle that that we were in. So they were very close and almost identical. But what happened was when they asked people to self-describe themselves, Democrat or Republican, the first time they were plus seven Democrat, and the second time they were plus two. So what does this mean? As a pollster, I'm looking at this, and, I can, and, and what I'm asking or thinking is, is, am I looking at greater identification with the Republican Party now in Virginia? Now, so is that real? Is that a real change that is happening, suggesting that, in fact, the Republican may be ahead because of that change in self-identification? On the other hand, I look back at other exit polls and what the party identification has been in the past. Uh, and the last governor's election in 2013, we saw a plus five Democrat and Terry McAuliffe, the Democrat, won by two and a half points. Um, in 2009, we found a plus one Republican, and that wasn't as competitive a race, and the Republican really ran away with the race at that point um, uh, by plus 17. But what you see is that Virginia generally, when they vote, is pretty close. Slightly Democrat one year, slightly Republican uh, the other year. And so what that means is this is likely to be a close race and very dependent upon who gets there. With so, a huge national that. implication, as you indicated. In right, the big national implication. I, it, so being from the media side of this, I, I would say mea culpa on the media's part, but also, hey, what do you want us to do? So on one hand, I'd say this is really up to the media to accurately, accurately report. These polls are both being very transparent about what they're doing and mm -hmm. why the numbers are, but in most of the reporting, that doesn't come out. Now, on the other side of the coin, being a, a, a journalist, I would say, yeah, like they're going to give me, you know, time to explain this difference. And since I don't have not nobody's going to be interested in this, it's going to be, you know, w w reading my story. I just don't have space for this. I'm doing a story about the, the governor's race. Um, I'm just going to average them because, you know, if they're both both, you know, scientific and they're, they just do some, you know, whatever, let's just average it. Why shouldn't I do that? Because so why shouldn't be, I? Because the average actually um, suggests that this is a race that's really leaning d very strongly democratic, um, and it and it may not be. And so and so that's the problem. So you really you don't have a clear picture in this. The polls are not providing a clear narrative. Maybe between Quinnipiac and Monmouth, they should meet somewhere halfway. Maybe about well, the that's joint. an average. Well, be they, careful with that. Well, they can have, they can have a duel on the GW Bridge. About <laughs> That's about halfway, <laughs> and uh, find out who they really think is going to be ahead of this. Because no, right now, a, you just can't really tough. tell. But but it is tough, and I think that Virginia is getting a lot of attention. I suspect that voters in Virginia know that, and they've been bombarded with a lot of ads. We've seen also in these polls um, that the favorability rating of these two candidates have been going up and down, mostly down. Yeah, well, um, negative ads, that happens. You drive both, both of them down, yeah. It, it, Exactly. So I think we're seeing quite a com competitive race and uh, one to watch. So that'll do it for this edition of Poll Hub, a production by the Marist Poll at Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. Our executive producer, Mary Griffith, our editor, Nicolette Strano. And please send any questions that you might have. We really want to know what you want to know to pollhub at marist.edu. 
and we're on social media. We talked about it a lot on this show. And hey, we're there too. Uh, at Maris Poll on Twitter, Maris Poll on Facebook, Snapchat, and Instagram. And wherever you are listening to this, if you look at the screen, there's a subscribe button. Hit it. We love to have you subscribe. That way you get to know when the new edition of Poll Hub comes out. It comes out every week where we're talking about polls and all the things around them. And we'll be back next week doing the same thing. Say goodbye, everybody. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye, everybody. That's a good yeah, deal. On Christmas, yeah. say Merry Christmas. On New Year's, say Happy New Year's. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. Bye.